Churches of Christ present Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. My name is Victor Eskew. I am the preacher for the Eastwood Church of Christ in Paris, Tennessee. Today our lesson is going to focus upon Bible concepts and social drinking. There is hardly any individual, especially if an individual believes in God, believes in Jesus, claims to be a Christian, who would condone drunkenness. For you see, we can easily turn into the pages of God's Word and we find drunkenness condemned. In Romans 13, 13, the Bible says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. The Apostle Paul gave a laundry list of sins in Galatians 5, 19 through 21 that he refers to as the works of the flesh. And in that list, one of those is drunkenness. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, now note this, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I told you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice that in both of these passages, drunkenness is condemned. Paul says, don't involve yourself in drunkenness. Paul also says that if you do get involved in drunkenness, that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So all Christians, all individuals who are followers of God would say, no, we do not need to be drunks. But there are many individuals today, even those who are children of God, who defend what is referred to as social drinking. These individuals believe that it is okay to have alcoholic wine at the meal table from time to time. They believe that it is acceptable to have a beer or two with an individual's friends. 
They might serve alcohol at very special events such as an anniversary or a wedding, maybe even a birthday. These individuals enjoy a little alcohol at the ball game. They don't mind getting off of work and maybe stopping in at the local pub and having a beer or two or maybe even a couple of uh, hard liquor drinks before they go home. And they believe that social drinking is acceptable, that it's good and that there's no problem with it whatsoever. Now as I have been in Bible classes and have taught about alcoholism, there are many individuals who will bring up numerous arguments, even arguments from the Word of God, in an attempt to defend social drinking. And before I ever get into those particular arguments, what I like to do is I like to talk about some of the concepts that the Word of God makes mention of that you and I need to apply in our lives if we're going to be faithful children of the living God. And I want us to talk about some of those concepts in this lesson. They're, therefore, the reason for the title, Biblical Concepts and Social Drinking. Because I believe if we understand these concepts, then we do not have to worry about all of the arguments that individuals try to bring to the table. What are these Bible concepts about which we speak? First, Christians are supposed to be individuals who live lives of great influence. From the very start of Jesus' ministry, He talks about a Christian's influence. In Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13, Jesus says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Jesus continues by saying, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all them that are in the house." Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Notice that Jesus is talking about influence. I want you to live your life in such a way that you are the salt of the earth. I want you to live your life in such a way that you are a light to the world. I want you to live your life in such a way that when other individuals see you, those individuals are going to glorify your Father which is in heaven. My friends, I ask you, do you honestly believe that you can truly be a person of influence by the drinking of alcohol? Not so. The very moment that someone sees you out at a bar, the very moment that an individual walks up and sees you with a drink in your hand, the very moment they see you at a ball game with a beer, slinging it around and yelling and screaming, those individuals do not immediately say, Oh, there's a Christian. No, they think of you as an individual of the world, do they not? And rightfully so, because that's the way individuals of the world act. You and I are to be individuals of influence. We are to be individuals who say, follow my example, do as I do. And if you do, then you can be followed, then you will follow me right into the very portals of heaven itself. But yet alcoholism and the drinking of alcohol does not help my Christian influence at all. A second concept that is found in the Bible is the concept of abstinence. In 1 Thessalonians 5.22, the Apostle Paul says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Peter says in his first epistle, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. My friends, the concept of abstinence is a Bible principle. Now I know that many individuals do not like to hear about abstinence. 
The word abstinence means this, to abstain from, to not participate in, to not involve oneself in, to flee from, to run from, to not engage in. Abstinence. Now notice that Paul tells us and Peter tells us that you and I are to abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from everything that is fleshly and carnal in nature. Don't get involved in it. Don't participate in it. Don't practice it. Abstain from it. Wouldn't that be wise when it comes to the drinking of alcohol? Don't participate in that. Abstain from it. Flee from it. Don't engage in it whatsoever. Make certain that your life is totally free therefrom. I sincerely believe that Timothy was a man of abstinence, don't you? He was a young man who had problems at times with his stomach. At that time, they didn't have medications like they do now in our society. And it was the Apostle Paul who had to command Timothy who had to demand of him, take a little wine for thy oft infirmities. Folks, here was a man who had difficulties medically and would not even take alcohol for those problems. He was a man of abstinence. He was what some might refer to as a teetotaler. Those are the kind of individuals that Christians need to be. We need to be people of abstinence. You know, we don't go around teaching our young people that it's okay to have a little sex. We don't go around teaching our young people that it's okay to have a little bit of drugs. We don't go around teaching our children that it's okay to involve themselves in a little pornography. So why do we do that when it comes to the subject of alcohol? We need to abstain therefrom. and We do not need to engage ourselves in the practice. Another concept that the Bible talks about is soberness. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 and verse 8, Paul talks about soberness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Verse 8 says this, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Twice the Apostle Paul says, I want you to be a sober individual. When we turn to the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul there is talking to various sections of the church. He talks to the elderly men. He talks to the young men. He talks to the young women. And he talks to the elderly women. And what I find is interesting is this. There is one quality that he demands of every one of those groups. And guess what that quality is? It is the quality of soberness. Now, here's what we need to do. We need to ask ourselves, what does soberness mean? When you turn into a good lexicon, here's the definition of soberness. Not intoxicated. Isn't that interesting? Be sober. Don't be intoxicated. My friends, the very moment that you put something into your mouth, the very moment you swallow, the very moment that substance goes into your system, you are beginning to intoxicate yourself. And yet the Bible demands of us not to do that. Be sober individuals. Be individuals who are right thinking. Be individuals who are always going to have your senses about you. You're going to be individuals who can always discern between what is good and what is not good. Between what is right and what is wrong. The very moment we put alcohol into our system, our ethical thought processes are impacted. They are slowed down. They are negated. And oftentimes individuals make horrible decisions under the influence of alcohol. And therefore, the Bible exhorts us, be sober. Don't involve yourselves in anything that intoxicates. So far, we've seen three biblical concepts, have we not? One of them is that Christians are to live lives of influence around other people. The second is that we are to abstain 
from fleshly lust. We are to abstain from those things that are wrong. And the third one is the concept of soberness. Don't involve yourself in things that are wrong, in things that intoxicate the system. There are other concepts also about which the Bible speaks with regard to this idea of social drinking. Another one is the concept of self-control or temperance. In 1 Corinthians 9.25, the Bible says this, Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We turn over into 2 Peter chapter 1, and there we find the Christian graces, do we not? The Apostle Peter says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Now note this, and to knowledge temperance. Temperance is a Christian virtue. Temperance involves self-control. It is the ability to grab all of one's senses, all of one's behaviors, and to bring them into a proper fashion as far as the Word of God is concerned. Self-control. And yet, when we get involved in such things as alcohol, the very thing that begins to slip from us is this thing called self-control. Not long ago, I had a friend of mine come to me and she says, Vic, there was a time when I believed that it was acceptable to social drink. My husband and I, we would go over to various friends' houses and we would drink socially. My friends would, or friends would come over to our house and we would have our refrigerator filled with beer and while they were there we would drink. And she says, I no longer believe that that's the case. And I was somewhat shocked because most of the time an individual's concept of social drinking doesn't change. And so I asked her, what's the problem? Why have you changed your thinking processes on social drinking? And she says, it's because of my husband. She says, now he's no longer just a social drinker. She says, the very moment he comes home from work and he gets home late at night, he goes into the closet, he goes into the refrigerator, and he gets out the beer, he gets out the alcohol, and he has become a drunk. And he's constantly in a drunken stupor. In fact, there have been times that he's even come to the church building. And there was liquor on his breath. I knew that he'd been drinking. And she says, now I understand that the moment you involve yourself in a little bit of that, that it can lead to your inability to control it, and rather it controlling you. My friends, we need to teach self-control temperance. We need our children to look at those athletic figures, especially those of the Olympic Games, and learn some lessons, do we not? Those individuals are extremely temperate. There's a certain type of diet that they engage in. There's a certain set of training that they engage in. So many hours of sleep that they are to engage in. And they do that day in and day out, day in and day out for years on end. Why? Because they want to win a gold medal. Paul says they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But notice how he finishes his statement. But we an incorruptible. My friend, we need to practice self-control, temperance, because we want to obtain a crown that lasts forever and ever, an eternal crown, a glorious crown, a crown of life, a crown of righteousness, a crown awarded those individuals who are faithful servants of the living God, having practiced self-control in this life. Let me ask you this. If you had a child, that you knew would partake of alcohol in just a little fashion because you encouraged him to social drink and yet he eventually became an alcoholic and died of liver disease, would you honestly say that social drinking is acceptable? 
Or would you now say, you know what I should have done? Instead of encourage him to drink, I should have encouraged him to be a person of self-control. I'm certain that parent would teach the latter and not the former. Another point that we need to consider with regard to the Bible is wisdom. In Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, Paul says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Listen to this, understanding what the will of the Lord is. My friends, you and I are only going to be on this earth around 70 to 80 years. Now, if you're young, that might seem like a long period of time. But all of us know that as we grow older, that time is extremely short. Those years are not very long. And while we're here, the Apostle Paul says, I want you to walk circumspectly. That little word circumspectly is interesting. That little word circumspectly means I want you to walk in a straight line. I want you to walk with your eyes forward and looking constantly around you, observing and seeing what's there. And don't deviate from that straight and narrow. I want you to walk as an individual who is wise, and I don't want you to walk like a foolish man. Have you ever seen an individual under the influence of alcohol? If there were such a thing as foolish, that's it, isn't it? All of us have now the privilege of turning on our television sets and everyone has phones so they can capture various moments where individuals are engaged in horrible behaviors. And we see all of these actors and actresses who are under the influence of alcohol, individuals who are speeding down roads, individuals who are doing crazy things in public, individuals who will speak against Those individuals in authority like the policemen. Individuals who are arrested. Individuals who have to go to rehab. Why? Because of alcoholism. My friends, that is a foolish behavior. Paul says, don't walk as a foolish man. Walk as a wise individual. And it is not wise to engage in the drinking of alcohol. Most alcoholics will look at a child... And they'll tell them this, don't you ever take the first drink. Now folks, that is wisdom. And sadly, we have Christian parents who are teaching their children by both mouth and example, oh, it's okay to take a little alcohol now and then. Not as fools, but as wise. Lastly, we need to follow Jesus' example. 1 John 2, 6 says this, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself so to walk even as he walked. The Bible exhorts us that if we are in Christ, if we are Christians, if we are children of the living God, that we ought to be individuals who follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Can anyone imagine an intoxicated Jesus? Can anybody imagine a Jesus who has drunk so much that he talks foolishly, that his speech is slurred, that he stumbles as he walks out of a room or he walks down the street? Can we imagine a Jesus who has to fall into bed and pass out because of his drunken stupor? Can we imagine a Jesus who wakes up in the morning and his head is hurting and pounding because he has a hangover, an individual who has to drink a little bit more the next day just in order to survive. Folks, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. And the Bible exhorts us, you follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. What would Jesus do? That used to be an old saying, did it not? But it's still a wise saying. And I'll grant you, Jesus would never participate in alcoholic beverages. As we come to a close of this lesson, we want to take just a few moments and talk to you about the gospel plan of salvation. In in Genesis chapter 3, sin was introduced into our world. 
It was told Adam and Eve that in the day that they ate of that forbidden fruit, that they would surely die. But what's interesting is the day they ate, they didn't die. That word shall sure, or those words shall surely die mean a violent, physical, bloody death, but that didn't happen. Why? The reason is because before the foundation of the world, God had developed a plan whereby man could be saved. In the first century, Jesus was sent into the world, was he not? Born of a woman, made under the law. Jesus grew up as a Jew, and then about the age of 30 years old, he entered into his earthly ministry here and began to prepare men to repent and to become members of the kingdom of God. Upon his death and his resurrection, he commanded 12 men, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When you study the accounts of that great commission, we find that these are the requirements. Go, teach. When individuals believe, baptize them for the remission of sin. Jesus said it very simply in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. My friends, as you look at the book of Acts, that's exactly what transpired. Those men went and they taught. And those individuals who believed were baptized into Christ. There are nine major conversion accounts. And in every account, those individuals were baptized into Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They became new creatures in Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4. They became new creatures according to uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. We're so thankful that you're listening to this uh, lesson today and hope that you will share it with other individuals. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, why I'm a member of the Church of Christ, and basic Bible lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ.